Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. Thank you, Ayla. That was beautiful music. Really appreciate the meaningful words. Certainly family is so important, and what a blessing that God is creating a family, a spiritual family. We certainly can look forward to that and appreciate God's amazing, miraculous plan. So I really appreciate the, the special music. Thank you so much. Well, it was two weeks ago. We were in our hotel room in Jerusalem. We had been celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles there. It had become the eighth day. And we were getting ready to go down for breakfast before services. It seemed like there was some kind of noise out, out there, outside the hotel. Found out it was sirens. And we thought, oh, what could that be? Is it, uh, is it Wednesday afternoon in Claremont County when they <laughs> sound off the alarms? We really didn't pay any attention to it. My wife and I kind of ignored it. We kept getting ready. We, we went down for breakfast and realized, wow, the world has changed. We heard about the Hamas attack from Gaza on Israel. Uh, we had heard some, well, we didn't really know what it was, but perhaps they were rockets from this iron dome that were shot off to intercept missiles that had been targeting uh, perhaps Jerusalem, we didn't know. There was so little that we could understand at that time because, you know, it had just begun and news reports were so sketchy and uh, it was difficult to know what was happening. Of course, we found out later it was a massive attack, surprise attack from Hamas, uh, Hamas on Israel from the Gaza. Now, we kept the eighth day, we went on, we had services, God blessed us, God protected us. Uh, some were trying then to leave to go home, the feast and the eighth day had ended. They went to Tel Aviv, which most of us flew into, to try to get out at that time, and then we began to hear more reports and some of the difficulties. There were a few that got out at that time, uh, but others were stuck at the airport. Uh, for the rest of us, we were leaving the next morning to try to cross over into Jordan, uh, many of us had signed up for an extension uh, of the tour to have the opportunity to go to Petra. And so we left in the morning, felt so strange to leave 20-plus people in Jerusalem or at the airport behind as 120 of us got on buses and went south to the Red Sea to cross over into Jordan. God certainly blessed us. Here it seemed like we could have been sitting ducks as three buses are traveling down a deserted highway out in the open. Uh, but I believe God certainly protected us and protected his people. Uh, eventually, everyone was able to get out. Those that did not get out that evening of the eighth day, uh, or the, right after the eighth day, were able to cross over into Jordan through the, the north crossing. And after a couple of days, we were able to kind of meet up in Amman, Jordan. And from there, uh, eventually, everyone was able to get out. A little bit of a challenging time. You didn't know what was going to happen. And now, of course, since then, things have certainly escalated. We had an opportunity to listen to our president on Thursday night. He spoke pretty frankly about this situation that really the world is facing. He said that Hamas and Putin represent different threats, but they share this in common. And he said they both want to completely annihilate neighboring democracy. Completely annihilate it. Some pretty serious words. He also went on to say the risk of conflict and chaos could spread to other parts of the world. And he specifically mentioned other parts of the world. He said, in the Indo-Pacific, in the Middle East, especially in the Middle East, he said, Iran is supporting Russia in Ukraine, and it's supporting Hamas and other terrorist groups in the region, and will continue to hold them accountable. So where is all this going to lead? You know, what is on the horizon? What can we make out of this? Is this prophecy being fulfilled right before our eyes? Well, Christ said something interesting in Matthew chapter 16, verse 2. 
maybe we haven't read this for a while, but Christ was certainly taking the Pharisees to task. They were supposed to be the religious leadership. They, the Sadducees, the scribes, they were the bigwigs of the day. And yet they couldn't recognize the fact that the Savior, that the Messiah, was right there before them. And he said to them, when it's evening, you say it'll be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it'll be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. And then he said, hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Christ has been pretty specific. When you look at what he prophesied, not only what he said here to the Pharisees, but he went on to describe specific conditions, specific events that would precede his return to earth. Passages that are describing these things found in Mark chapter 13, Luke chapter 21, Matthew chapter 24, discuss the end times, the end of the age. I believe that's the times that we're living in, in history. And Christ said in Matthew 24, 3, as the disciples asked them, him, what, what was the sign of your coming? What will be the sign of the end of the age? And of course, Matthew 24, Luke 13, uh, uh, Luke, uh, Mark 13, Luke 21, all describe these things. He talks about deception. He talks about wars and rumors of wars, nations rising up against nations, earthquakes, famines, pestilences. And he describes some of these things in detail. And in Luke 21, 31, he says very specifically, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. So are we being presumptuous that we live in difficult times, that we live in scary times? Now, are we right there yet? No, I don't think so. But boy, we've sure moved a lot closer to the edge of the cliff, haven't we? And how will this transpire? What's going to happen next? What's ahead? And can we count on being safe? When we were in Israel, once we found out what was happening, we weren't sure. I mean, we knew we had to trust in God. And oftentimes we fall back on that, that nice feeling that God's going to always protect us. God's going to keep us in a place of safety. God's going to watch over us. But if you notice in Matthew 24, verse 9, Christ said something pretty shaking. He says, as he's talking about these end times, these difficult scenarios, the sign of his coming, he said, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. He didn't mince any words. He says, you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Many will be offended and betray one another and will hate one another. Scary words. In fact, they mirror those words that we find in Revelation 20, verse 4. We may have heard them at the feast, where John envisioned individuals who had been beheaded for the witness to Jesus and for the word of God. Not talking about those in the past, because he was very specific. Those who did not worship the beast. Those who didn't fall into worshiping the image or the false prophet that didn't receive the mark. That's talking about this time just ahead. So certainly these words are ones that we have to realize. These are things we face. These are things that could be in store for our future. In fact, John chapter 16, verse 2, just lays it on the line. It says, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think he offers God service. And certainly we see that playing out in our world today. There are those terrorist organizations that are out there that think they do God a favor by maiming and killing and raping and destroying and terrorizing others. And of course, Christ spoke about this time of great tribulation that's just ahead. And yet we won't all be safe. Christ was specific. There will be martyrdom. People will be martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ, for their refusal to worship the system of the beast that will not fall for the lies of the false prophet. Now, looking at these things, look at the situation that we faced two weeks ago 
it would easily come to us to be afraid, to be fearful, to worry, and to be overwhelmed with anxieties. Now, we don't want to kid ourselves. These are dangerous times. These are difficulties. It would be normal to feel apprehensive about these things that are facing, whether that's this global crisis that we're right in the middle of at the moment, or even if it's personal trials, personal difficulties. They can be daunting, no doubt about it. So considering these things, how can we avoid living in fear? How can we face these types of difficulties with faith and with confidence? I mean, is there a way that we can have fearless faith facing the future? Can we? God tells us yes. No matter the circumstances, no matter the difficulties, no matter how many rockets are fired, we can have fearless faith facing what lies ahead in the future. So let's think about a number of those things that we can rely on. I think first and foremost, we have to recognize we can trust God. We have to place our trust in the sovereignty of God. Now that sounds like, oh, that's an easy one. That's pretty simple. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? Well, wait a second. Is trusting God that simple? Well, if we really trust in his power, we really trust in his rule, we really trust in his authority, that reality can be revolutionary in our thinking because it's the cornerstone of fearlessness. To having a fearless type of faith, we have to place our trust in God's power and his authority and in God himself. There's a beautiful song that David wrote, Psalm 46, uh, 56, verse 3. Let's notice it. Psalm 56, notice verse 3. In Psalm 56, we find when we face these difficult times, whether personally or whether on a global scale, as God's people, do we trust in the power and authority of God? Do we trust in his word? Here it's written, verse 3, Psalm 56, When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. I'm not going to let that get away from me. I'm not going to let my thinking, my worries, my anxieties, my panic attacks get away from me. Because I'm going to put my trust in you, in God, whose word I praise. Because God's power and his authority, his sovereignty is, ex is revealed to us through his word. And we can recognize, we can trust in God. We can have faith in what he says. And so he says, in God I've put my trust. I shall not be afraid. After all, what can flesh do to me? Well, they could maim me. They could kill me. They could martyr me. They could behead me like they did those little babies in Israel two weeks ago. That's horrible. That's unbelievable. But who's in charge? Who is sovereign over our life? Who says he'll never leave us or forsake us? Who has said all things work together for good for those who love God? Who has said that? You see, when we realize we put our trust in God and his sovereignty, there is no room for human opposition. No reason for our thinking to take a different power, a different venue, a different perspective. Because there is powerful peace that comes from trusting in God. We don't have to have a troubled heart. We don't have to have anxiousness because when we trust in God, it's a reflection of the fact we recognize God is in control. Even though circumstances look totally out of control, he's in charge. And that can bring a settled perspective, a settled heart, because ultimately, we are safe. We are safe. The minor prophets reflected the same perspective, trusting God, trusting in his sovereignty. The prophet Nahum, not a book we often turn to, but at the very beginning of Nahum's prophecies, chapter 1, verse 7, 
He puts a little bit different spin on this. I think that really can bring it home for us when we recognize the simplicity of our faithful trust in God and his rule and authority in this world. Nahum, chapter 1, verse 7. Have we thought of it in this way? He writes, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. He knows those who take refuge. Do we rely on ourselves? Do we rely on our iron dome? Do we rely on our defenses? Or do we rely on God? You see, this is telling us God designed us. He made us to operate on trust. He made us. We are thinking, reasoning, human beings made in the image of God. And he didn't give us all capabilities. He didn't give us all knowledge. He didn't give us all understanding or all wisdom. We've got just a little bit. We're made in his image. So we are limited human beings. So you could say God designed us to trust in him. Because whatever knowledge or wisdom or strength that he provides, and we trust in him, we recognize if there's real wisdom, if there's any strength whatsoever, it's through him. Because we reach our limits pretty quickly. And what Nahum reminds us, he is wanting and he is willing to be our stronghold, no matter what the time, especially in times of trouble. And so his unchanging nature is one that he wants us to trust in him. And if we have that foundation, that's the beginning. That is a a firm foundation for fearless faith. And so trusting in him, honoring him, recognizing his power and rule, not only in the world, but more specifically, his power and rule in my life, in every aspect of my life, is a reflection of that fearless faith that he wants all of us to have. The prophet Jeremiah mentions this as well. Jeremiah 32, verse 17. This one certainly seals the deal, you might say. Notice the way that Jeremiah makes this point of how we can have fearless faith as as we face the future. Trusting in the sovereignty of God, Jeremiah, verse 17 of chapter 32, he says, Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Oh, yeah, I need that reminder sometimes that God is so awesome, he's made everything. He made it all out of nothing. Is there anything too great that God can't accomplish, that's a reminder for all of us. God's done it all. And so he expresses the obvious. Nothing's too hard for you. Nothing's too hard. God has the power, the ability to accomplish whatever he wills. And so trusting in him, it shows that fact that we recognize there is nothing beyond his control. There's nothing beyond his authority. And should that then bring us confidence? Should that then recognize in our minds that God can eradicate fear? He says, absolutely, there's nothing too hard for you. I don't have to live a life in distress. I don't have to let my mind get away from me. I don't have to live in anxiousness. There is a solution that God provides so that we can have that kind of fearless faith. I mean, recognize the fact there's some tough times ahead. Is this the precursor for that? Certainly it is. Certainly it's a step in the direction of fulfilling prophecy. Well, how quickly will that come about? Well, we'll have to see. We'll have to see. We know Bible prophecy reveals there's going to become unity that will be forged in the Arab Muslim world. And whether it's through an event like the one we are witnessing right now, or whether some future leader, some Mahdi might appear to bring them all together, we know that circumstances will lead to a united Arab Muslim world. Could it be now? Could it be? Well, Psalm 83 
reminds us of that very fact. Notice what Psalm 83 verse 2 tells us in this regard. Certainly prophecy reminds us there are troubled times ahead. And are we at that point of no return? Psalm 83 verse 2, it says, Behold, your enemies make a tumult. It's like a riot. There are those that hate you, and they've lifted up their head. Verse 3, they've taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They've said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. Now, of course, we recognize modern-day Israel is basically just the tribe of Judah. So this prophecy in Psalm 83 can be expanded to all of Israel, to the Israelite people, those that are a part of the lost ten tribes. This is reflecting a little bit of what Daniel 11 talks about, the king of the south that will be united. There is coming a Middle Eastern power block that will form this confederacy and wield amazing influence and power in the Middle East. That's worrisome. It's troublesome, and it, it can weigh on us. Is that where we're going? Well, what should be our perspective? Can we have fearless faith facing the future? God says, Absolutely. What has God promised us? Do we put our trust in the promise of the presence of God? God promises to be with us. Even in the worst of situations, what does God tell us? What does he remind us of? We do have the promise of God's presence so that we can have an unshakable faith. In fact, we oftentimes will sing hymn 27 out of our hymnal. That's the hymn that says, God is our refuge. Right? We sing that. You probably know the words to it. God is our refuge and our strength. Yeah, straits a present aid. God is presently with us. Therefore, although the earth remove, we will not be afraid. Yeah, that's Psalm 46. If you want to turn over to Psalm 46... These are the lyrics to hymn 27. God is our refuge. And it is such a reminder. He is always with us. He's promised to always be with us. And so we can have that assurance. God's not going anywhere. Psalm 46, right at the very beginning. God is our refuge and strength. He is our shelter. He's better than any iron dome. God is our refuge. He protects us. He watches over us. We've just finished observing the Feast of Tabernacles. We are to tabernacle with God. God is our covering. God is our Sukkot. God is our tabernacle. He watches over us. He says he's a very present help in trouble. Very present. He is right here always. And so as a result, verse 2, Therefore, we will not fear earth is removed, though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea. Are these things prophesied? Yeah, you better believe it. Absolutely. He says, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. Yeah, there's going to be some shaking going on, no doubt about it. What's our perspective? God's with us. He's our strength. He's our support. Yeah, it's going to be frightening. We could have this tendency to be terrified or faint-hearted, intimidated by whatever the circumstances we may face. But God tells us, as our source of strength, as our source of courage, as our source of confidence, we will not fear. We're not going to let that get away from us. Because as soon as we have that tendency, we're going to come right back to this. He's here, no matter what, no matter how dire it may be. And so he reminds us of this fact over and over and over again. Psalm 
Another psalm reminds us of this. Psalm 91 is, is a, a, a psalm of God's protection and refuge. He is our fortress. He's protecting us. And so he does that because he loves us. And he says it's his promise, his promise to protect us as we recognize him in our life. And how many of those passages says he's going to protect us with his righteous right hand? I think that's Isaiah 41 that reminds us of that very thing. And so as we look at what's going on in the world today, no doubt there are forces out in this world of darkness. And they are at work, and they are aligned not only against modern-day Israel, but ultimately, we know prophecy says they are aligned against God. They are aligned against the plan of God. They are aligned against us. They are aligned against those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. That time is coming and will become that much more evident. And we recognize the fact that it's Satan behind these workings. And he's been at this for a long time. And he is cunning and he is deceitful and he knows. He knows vulnerabilities. He knows that we could be vulnerable. And it's such a reminder that he waits for an opportune time to try to derail our faith. If you read the temptation of Christ, it even speaks to that fact that Christ waits for an opportunity. Now that reminds me what happened two weeks ago. Israel was caught by surprise. They freely admit that. Hamas, a terrorist group out of Gaza, caught them by surprise when they least expected it. Tells us our enemy looks for an opportune time. Because the fact is, we're only as strong as our weakest point. So as we think about that, we could think about another key in how we can have fearless faith as we face the future. It's possible. And what's happened in the last two weeks has told that story. Don't be caught off guard. Don't be caught off guard. The assaults are coming. The spiritual bombs will fly against us. Don't put your guard down. We were clueless when the sirens went off. We didn't know what was happening. It was like, well, it must be something else. We weren't thinking about those kinds of things. Yeah, have we seen that before in our world? Yeah, I think so. Maybe not war. Not all that long ago, COVID caught us off guard, caught the world off guard. Our supply chain, what happened to it? Well, things caught us off guard. Well, what's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to us if the grid goes down? What's going to happen to us if, well, there's a hurricane? We lived in New Orleans for a number of years. Always had to be ready for those times. Now, physically, we're not preppers. We're not going to save ourselves physically by storing up years' worth of food or anything like that. But it tells the story. We better be spiritually prepared. We better build ourselves up and strengthen ourselves in the fa faith now. Now is the time to be prepared for even more difficult times ahead. Christ spoke of this in Luke 21. The Olivet Prophecy, whether we read it in Luke 21 or Matthew 24, Mark 13. Well, let's see what he says in Luke 21, verse 22. Notice how he frames this time that lies just ahead. Luke 21, 22, he says, These are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Those prophecies that we've always read about, maybe that we've overlooked, that we haven't taken that seriously, here they are, right here on the horizon. Down in verse 34, don't be worried about the prophecies. They're going to be fulfilled. They're going to take care of themselves. But as a result of this, Christ says in verse 34, take heed to yourselves. 
You don't have to figure out all the timing and the exact uh, time that these things are going to happen and the exact way they're going to play out. But you better be concerned about yourself. He says, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, the cares of this life, and that that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And so we're told really clearly, okay, maybe we don't have to worry about carousing and drunkenness. Is that my issue? Maybe not. But boy, can the cares of life get in the way? Can we be distracted from the way of God? You see, Christ is reminding us we have to attach ourselves to our Savior. He's the solid rock, and we better be attached now because difficult times are coming, and we will not be able to stand on our own. That's a fact. But if we stand on the rock, God will stand with us and hold us up when we cannot stand. So the real antidote to confronting future tribulation To be prepared now, to be spiritually ready. Spiritual preparedness is the key to eliminating fear. That's how we can overcome. There's an inseparable connection between spiritual readiness and fearlessness in the face of adversity. James wrote about that perspective that we have to strive to have. James chapter 1, verse 2 is a familiar section of Scripture. This is that section of James where he writes, Brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Might cause us to step back and say, wow, what's so fun about trials and difficulties? That doesn't sound very joyful. Well, if you take a look at what James 1, verse 2 says, I'll read this in the voice transliteration here. The voice says this, James 1, verse 2, don't run from tests and hardships. As difficult as they are, you will ultimately find joy in them. If you embrace them, if you embrace them, he says, your faith will blossom under pressure and teach you true patience as you endure. And true patience brought on by endurance will equip you to complete the long journey and cross the finish line, mature, complete, and wanting nothing. Boy, I like the way that's worded. Yeah, trials and tribulation, they're coming. And it may not be war. It may not be that kind of... Tri- Maybe other challenges that we will face. But as we do... We can be strengthened as we are spiritually ready. And we have a mindset, a mindset that we trust in God. And we know that this might not be a lot of fun. This might not be joyful at the moment. But we know joy will come. Joy is on the horizon. It will be there. God has promised it. So that no matter what, we can know that he has our best interest at heart. And whether we're persecuted or whether... We even would be martyred, that ultimately God's will is undoubtedly going to be accomplished. Now, that means we have to live in a state of readiness. We have to be ready for his coming. That means consistently developing a stronger, closer relationship with him. That means we've got to cultivate that deeper relationship with God. That means to be spiritually prepared means I've got to see my life differently Because it's in that deep relationship with God that there is strength. That deep relationship with God the Father and Jesus Christ brings confidence. It helps us to have that assurance, knowing that God is always there, no matter what the day may look like. And so we have to ask ourselves, do I really know and understand how to put this Christian life into practice? I have to be honest with myself. Am I really growing deeper in prayer? Have I made worship a priority in my life? And what about my commitment? Even my commitment to God's church. 
This is not the time to be some solitary hermit. We have to be together. We are the people of God. We are the church of God. He intended us to be together. We need each other because we're in a spiritual war. This is more than just a battle, and we are called to sacrifice. We are called to strive, and we're called to advance against evil enemies, not just cower back in fear, but take on the offensive against evil, because true Christianity is a war. It's a war against Satan. It is a war against the world, and it is a war against ourselves, our own attitudes. And so we're reminded, don't be caught off guard. Reminds us, look out. Look out for temptation. Now's the time to have a fearless faith that causes me to take an inventory of my life, to step back and ask myself, where do I need to be strengthened? in faith? Where am I weak? In what areas of my life am I most tempted to get off the path? And that's where I can turn to God and trust Him and ask Him, help me, God. Help me to identify where I fall short in my relationship with you. Help me to take the steps I need to change. And that should lead us to some very specific things. As God opens our mind, we can draw closer to Him, which means I have to be on guard. Scripture reminds us, I have to guard my eyes. What am I looking at? What is it that I watch? What is it that I see? What is it on those screens that captivate me so easily that distract me? I have to guard my eyes. I have to guard my hands. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Are we doing the spiritual things with our might? Are we working? Are our hands involved in things that honor God? Because when we're not, when we're idle, when we have time to kill, boy, are we susceptible? Are we more open to do the things or click the things or go to those things that are least helpful, that could be most spiritually deceptive? See, we have to remember, where does sin begin? Well, it begins in my mind. And I have to guard my mind through the power of the Spirit of God. Now, if you're still here in James, look down to verse 14. He reminds us very clearly, each one of us is tempted when we're drawn away by our own desires and enticed. By our, so our first line of defense has to be to refuse to even contemplate wrongful actions, wrongful thoughts, to allow those thoughts to develop. We've got to kick those out immediately. We've got to take the offensive, take the precautions. Don't be caught off guard. And so what spiritual initiatives am I taking to avoid disaster? Peter reminds us, Satan's out there prowling around. He's ready to attack when we least expect it. So we have to stay alert. We have to be careful. We have to be watching out for the enemy. And so that means I've got to quit reaching for that that button that's going to light up my senses. It's going to kick off that dopamine rush. And whether it's some audio or video or some experience that's going to distract me from the ultimate goal, phones, texting, videos, movies, it's all out there. We can totally isolate ourselves from the ways of this world, from our spiritual objectives, and put on our notifications for whatever we want to see. Well, what is it? What is it that comes up on your notifications? What is it that, well, you like this, now you'll like that? Would you be embarrassed to have God take a look at that list of things that come up? Well, it comes up because you've been looking at those things. You've been clicking on those things. You've been watching those things. And I have too, and that's wrong. It delineates what our priorities are. And if it's been out of line, then we better be careful. We better realign our priorities and stop allowing those things to divert us. Stop allowing those things to preoccupy our thinking with those constant distractions. God wants us to have that strong, 
relationship with him and not be caught off guard by being spiritually unprepared. And so he wants us to grow. He wants us to learn. He wants us to serve. And so we have to determine not to put off living more like a Christian any longer. We have to be one that is dedicated, no matter what, to serve God. And so I think that brings an important question. I can ask myself, if this is all going that direction, imagine if Christ were to return next week. Well, there's a lot of things that have to happen before that happens. But just imagine that for a moment. If Christ were to return next week, what would I do differently this week? What would I do differently? Is that an indication of what I need to change? See, being spiritually prepared means seeing the need to change the way we live and seeing the need for repentance and forgiveness means stepping out in faith, because God wants us to have that fearless faith. And one thing he doesn't want us to underestimate, a key in that fearless faith, is found in the power of prayer. The power of prayer. He reminds us we don't have to live in fear. We don't have to be overwhelmed by panic attacks. We don't have to worry about night terrors. Even if they come, we can realign our thinking. And as Psalm 34, 4 says, I sought the Lord and he heard me. And he delivered me from all my fears. That's a promise we can take to the bank. We can count on that. In fact, if you're still in the New Testament, look at Philippians 4, 6. Philippians 4, 6, I think it takes Psalm 34 and puts it into perspective. God promises to deliver us from all our fears. And so Paul writes here in verse 6 of Philippians 4, don't be anxious about anything. Oh, wait a second, those thoughts come. I can't totally eradicate those things from my mind. But when they do come, what do I do with that thought? Well, here he tells us, in every situation, in every circumstance, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make those requests, present those requests to God. Recognize that promise in Psalm 34, that he will deliver us. And expect it. Count on it. Recognize the sovereignty of God. Recognize his rule and his authority. And he says, I will deliver you. I will deliver you. Because the ultimate result then, as Paul writes, the peace of God which transcends all understanding, that will guard our hearts and minds. See, that'll change our thinking. And so prayer is a powerful tool for dealing with fear. And so there were times two weeks ago, take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Refresh your thinking. Pray, pray, because it's such a reminder. Our life here, wow, we couldn't wait to get home. Well, does that mean we escape all of this stuff? For a moment, for a moment, it's still raging. It's still raging over there. Are we going to be able to stay out of that? Well, we know ultimately, no. We know we can't. So if we don't recognize our, our need for God, we show ourselves to be proud people, self-sufficient people. We can't have that perspective. Proud, self-sufficient people do not pray properly. It's a hindrance to our prayer. If we want to stay in control, how can we become a person of deep-seated prayer? If we don't recognize that we need to be humble people before God and recognize the fact God wants to intervene for us. He wants to deliver us. He wants to recognize, wants us to recognize our need. And he wants us to do just that. But all too often, what do we do? I think all too often we see God as this 
heavenly vending machine. We just press the button and, oh, Bob pops out something we need for the moment. And that's sometimes our perspective. Of, oh, I need this God, and so we ask him for this need, and we, we, we think that might be a help. We can't look at God like that. I think that kind of delineates this difference between seeing the hand of God, recognizing God's hand, and seeking his face. Is there a difference? Yeah, I seek the hand of God. God, give me this. God, give me a better job. I'll press that button. God, give me a better family. God, give me... And we have all these wants. But what do we really need? Take a look at 2 Chronicles 7. 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14, is, is just one of those passages that delineate this difference between seeking God's hand... And seeking his face. Seeking his hand versus seeking his face. Having a heavenly vending machine versus having a relationship with the almighty creator God of all things. Second Chronicles 7.14. Beautiful song that's written that reflects these very words that's out there as well. Second Chronicles 7.14, it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray... And seek my face. Turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. You see, seeking God's face means a relationship with God. We are face to face with God. Like a Abraham. Like a Moses. They weren't just looking for a handout. They were looking for a relationship with God. They were face to face with God. That's what prayer is all about, seeking the face of God, not just a heavenly vending machine, but a relationship with God. And having that relationship means we trust him, means we want a relationship with him, means that we can see the power of God's essence, his authority ultimately revealed because he's given us this, this amazing, amazing privilege to have a relationship with him. And so to have that kind of faith, seek his face. Seek that deep-seated relationship. And don't discount the power of prayer. Certainly this world is filled with challenges, uncertainties. I believe we are at that time of the end. What's going to happen next? Well, we know even the newscasters are describing it as unprecedented, world trouble on a potential global scale. Yeah, that can be worrisome. But it's also a point of the fact we're on the threshold of the kingdom of God. And so as we face what the future may bring, we know God's given us a wealth of wisdom. He's given us comfort that can guide us through these difficult times. So let's be sure, no matter what, we trust him. We trust in his power, his authority, his might, his sovereignty, and have a confidence that he's with us. He is present. And even more than that, he wants to help us no matter what. And so that's going to move us to be spiritually ready, to be prepared, to not be caught off guard. And we're going to make that our spiritual priority, to seek his face, to come before him in more earnest prayer than ever before. Because God reminds us, no matter what's happening, we can have courage to confront the adversities with unwavering confidence. When we are spiritually ready, we can boldly face the difficulties that are bound to come, knowing that God will provide us with the strength and he will provide us with the confidence we need so that undoubtedly we can have fearless faith facing the future.